Our final and tenth key to Bible prophecy is understanding the nature of the tribulation. Many Christians have no real concept of the tribulation as a distinct period of time, but rather see it as just part of the church age, in which life on earth is a bit worse than usual. As well as seeing the return of the Messiah in power and glory to establish his kingdom, the Old Testament prophets saw that there would be a special time of unparalleled evil and distress on the earth, especially for Israel, in the time just before the Messiah's coming as judge and king. This time would be unique in all history. Daniel 12 says there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, that's Israel, everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued. In Matthew 24, Jesus uses similar language to describe the time just before his return in power and glory, saying, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will, unless those days had been cut short, that's by the return of the Christ, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short. Both Daniel 12 and Matthew 24 imply that Jesus will return to save the believing remnant of Israel, the elect, who are facing imminent annihilation. Then Matthew twenty four twenty nine says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Jesus called this time leading up to his return the tribulation. It will last for seven years because it is also Daniel's 70th week, as we'll see in the next talk. Halfway through these seven years, the Antichrist will desecrate the temple with the abomination of desolation. And Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24, 15. This will initiate the second half of the tribulation, described by Jesus as the Great Tribulation in Matthew 24:21. The tribulation is a special and distinct seven-year period of time that commences after the church age and ends with the return of Christ. The great tribulation is the last and worst half of these seven years. The book of Revelation describes these seven years in great detail from chapters 6 to 19. Later, we'll see that the true church will be raptured before the tribulation, but the apostate church will go into the tribulation, and Jesus will then spew her out of his mouth, as Jesus warned in Revelation 3, verse 16. We also see the judgment of this harlot church in Revelation 17. He also speaks of her in Revelation 2.22, saying, Behold, I'll throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Many will be saved in the tribulation, and there will be many martyrs, especially in the great tribulation, whom John sees as being in heaven in Revelation 7.14, saying, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Tribulation means trouble. Now it's true that Jesus told us in John 16, that in the world you will have tribulation, speaking of the church. In other words, we face troubles and persecution in the church age, but they're nothing compared to what will happen in the tribulation. When Jesus used the term the tribulation to describe this special time of trouble for the whole world and especially Israel at the end of the age, he was referring to Jeremiah 30 verse 7, which calls it the time of Jacob's trouble or tribulation, and then adds that Jacob will be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 3 to 11, describes this time that leads up to Israel's salvation and her restoration in the Messianic kingdom. Verse 3 says, For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. This is one of many prophecies that predict the regathering of Israel from captivity in all the nations. These prophecies generally present this regathering from the nations as taking place in two stages. First, there will be a partial regathering of Israel to the land in unbelief. And then, when Messiah returns, there will be a final and complete regathering at the start of the Messianic kingdom. And this time, Israel will be in faith. As we read on, it will become clear that Jeremiah 30 is describing the initial partial regathering of Israel in unbelief. For having returned to the land, she still has to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. 
The fact that God calls the nation Jacob rather than Israel indicates that she's still in unbelief concerning her Messiah. When in unbelief, the nation is called Jacob. When in faith, you see, the nation's called Israel. So Jeremiah 30, verse 3, has been fulfilled in recent times with Israel returning to her land and being reborn as a nation in 1948. God did not regather her because she repented. It was a sovereign act of God to vindicate his name and fulfill his unconditional covenant with Abraham. His plan is to restore Israel to the land and then deal with her there as a nation in order to bring her to repentance and to restore her to himself. He first restores her to the land and then he restores her to the Lord. Jeremiah 30 verse 4 and 5 continues, Now these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. This predicts that when God has regathered Israel to the land, she will still face dangerous times. Therefore there is still much trouble for Israel ahead, because she's still in unbelief. Then verse 6 says, Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? Here we see this time compared to a time of birth pains, because a baby, the kingdom of God, is going to be born on the earth. The rabbis called this time of tribulation, before the manifestation of Messiah's glorious kingdom, they called it the birth pains of the Messiah. The presence of sin and the curse, you see, sets up a resistance to every birth, resulting in birth pains just before the birth. So as the baby pushes through to be born, it causes birth pains in the mother. Likewise, in the tribulation, the kingdom of God starts to force itself into manifestation in the earth. As it does, it comes into conflict with the kingdoms, kingdoms of this world, which are under sin, the curse and the kingdom of darkness. This will result in the sudden onset of worldwide birth pains, which will grow in intensity until the baby, that's the kingdom of God, is born on the earth. Like a woman in pregnancy, the earth has been moving towards the birth of the messianic kingdom upon the earth. The tribulation is the relatively short time of birth pains, just before the birth. As one day is to nine months, so seven years is to two thousand years. When Jesus was asked for the signs of his coming, which will indicate when the kingdom baby is about to be born, he first described the start of the tribulation as the sudden onset of intense birth pains manifesting as worldwide war, famine, disease and disturbances in nature. That's in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there'll be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Thus, the tribulation can only be understood in connection with the coming messianic kingdom. The prophecy continues in Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress or tribulation or trouble. This agrees with the description in Daniel 12 and Matthew 24 that this is a unique time, worse than any other time ever. It will be a time of trouble for the whole world, but especially for Israel. We will see that the reason for this is Israel's national rejection of Christ, compounded by the fact that in the tribulation she puts her trust in and makes a covenant with the Antichrist. Verse 7 also introduces another technical term for the tribulation when it says, that day is great, so that none is like it. This can only refer to the day of the Lord, a time when God directly intervenes in human history, either by judging or by ruling. So here, as in many places, that day is shorthand for the day of the Lord. Verse 7 concludes with a promise saying, It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved from it. So by the end of the seven years of Jacob's distress or trouble, Jacob will repent and Israel as a whole, as a nation, will be saved. Jesus Christ will return at the Battle of Armageddon and save Israel, who by now will have received him and be calling upon him as her Messiah, her Saviour King. Then verse 8 in Jeremiah 30 says, It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck and tear off their bonds, and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. God promises deliverance at the end of the tribulation with the second coming of Christ. Verse 9 then describes Israel in the Messianic kingdom, saying, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. 
Then verse 10 describes the final and complete regathering of Israel from the nations by the Messiah himself, saying, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity, and Jacob will return and be quiet and at ease, and no one will make him afraid, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you, for I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you, only I will not destroy you completely." So there is a unique time that is yet to come called the tribulation. Its uniqueness is not just because evil is allowed to come to its fullness through the Antichrist, but also because it's a, it's a time of divine wrath. Hence it is called the day of the Lord. This is why it must be distinguished from the church age. For in the church age, God is not generally moving in judgment. And we saw that in the parable of the tares, where we saw that the Lord is withholding his judgment until the end or consummation of the age. You see, there are two Greek words for end. First, telos, which means the final end. And this is used to describe the second coming of Christ. The second word is suntelia, which means consummation the period of time during which all things are brought to a close. So when a school talks about the end of term, it usually means the last few days. Likewise, when a teacher wraps up his message and brings all his main points together in his conclusion in the final few minutes of his lesson, he might call this the end of his lesson. When the Bible speaks of the end of the age, it's this word suntelia, and it's better translated consummation of the age, a special time when all things are brought to up to a head and a conclusion. In other words, it's a reference to the tribulation. One reason why I believe the church will be raptured before the tribulation is that the tribulation is a time of divine wrath and judgment, and the church has been promised deliverance from the wrath of God. We will see when we study Matthew 24, that verse 36 to 44, that Jesus compared the time before and after his coming in the rapture to the days of Noah, saying in verse 37, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. The outstanding event, of course, in the days of Noah was the flood, a worldwide judgment in which all unbelievers were killed. Likewise, the whole tribulation will be a worldwide judgment, leaving only believers alive at its end to populate the millennium. Before the flood, life on earth was going on as normal, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, 38. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. The people had no idea, you see, that judgment was about to fall, even though Noah warned them. Likewise, as in the days of Noah, just before the tribulation, life will be carrying on normally, and they'll even be saying, peace and safety. By the way, this is one reason why the flood is a type of the whole tribulation and not just the second coming. For in the days just before the second coming, described in detail in the book of Revelation, anything but normal life is going on. This is the great tribulation, the worst time ever. And Jesus said if he didn't cut it short, all flesh would be destroyed. The final event before the flood fell was the disappearance of believers into the ark when God removed them from the scene of judgment and lifted them up, up above it. As Matthew twenty four thirty eight says, they were living their normal life until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they didn't understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Likewise, the final event before the tribulation flood falls will be the disappearance of all the believers into Christ at the rapture. God will remove the true church from the earth by lifting us up above the scene of judgment before pouring out his tribulation judgments. Jesus then described this rapture of believers that happens in conjunction with his return in Matthew 24, 40 to 42. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One taken, the other left. Therefore be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Then in verse 43, Jesus compared his coming in the rapture to, to a thief coming suddenly in the night to take the valuable things from the earth, saying, Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So it will appear to the world after the rapture has happened that a thief has come and taken multitudes of people. 
Now, it's true that Jesus comes to take the precious things from the earth, his people. But of course, he's not really a thief, for he will only take what belongs to him. To the world, he will come as a thief. But for us, he will come as the bridegroom for his bride to rescue her from danger before waging war on the world system that's under the power of the evil one. In the parallel passage in Luke 21, 34 to 36, after describing the events of the tribulation, Jesus said, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day, that's the day of the Lord or tribulation, that that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap for it. That's the tribulation will come on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. In other words, it will be a worldwide judgment. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may be counted worthy to escape. That's in the rapture. All these things that are about to take place in the tribulation and to stand before the Son of Man. Since the events of the tribulation come upon all those on the earth, the only way to escape all these things is to be removed from the earth. And this is exactly what Jesus will do in the rapture to those who are counted worthy through their faith in Christ. They will be lifted up from the earth and find themselves standing before the Son of Man in their glorified bodies. Thus the teaching of Jesus is that before the worldwide judgment of the day of the Lord falls, he will return as a thief to take the believers to himself. Thus as far as the world is concerned, the initial act of judgment of the day of the Lord is when Jesus gets up from sitting at the right hand of the Father and returns to receive his own to himself. By removing the church, he is removing his restraint on evil, allowing it to come to its fullness in order for it to be judged. This action also allows him to move in greater judgment. Thus the day of the Lord begins with the coming of the Lord to rapture his church and then continues to the end of the tribulation as he continues to pour out his judgments. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 onwards, the apostle Paul described the rapture claiming that his teaching on this was according to the Lord's own teaching. Then, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he addressed the issue of the timing of the rapture and the tribulation, using the very same language and coming to the same conclusion as the Lord did in his teaching. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 and 2, he says, Now, as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, that is the tribulation, will come just like a thief in the night. In agreement with the teaching of Jesus, Paul is saying here that the day of the Lord will start suddenly, without warning, with the Lord's coming as a thief to take his own in the rapture, according to the very language that Jesus used. Verse 3, then, gives more detail about the start of the day of the Lord, confirming that it refers to the tribulation, not to the second coming of Christ. Because he says, while they, that is the unbelieving world, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction, that's the judgment of the tribulation, will come upon them. That's on the world, not the church. It will come on them suddenly, like labor pains on a woman with a child. He describes the time just before the day of the Lord as being apparently normal, where people are even saying, peace and safety. Then he describes the start of the day of the Lord judgments as the sudden onset of labor pains, which then continue to intensify until the birth, which is the second coming. Thus, the day of the Lord is the time of labor pains, a classic definition of the tribulation. Notice he also clearly distinguishes the experience of believers, referred to as you, and unbelievers, referred to as they, in relation to the day of the Lord. He specifically says that the sudden destruction of the tribulation will come on them, but not on you. That's the church. Then he says in verse 4, and they will not escape, that is, they will not escape the day of the Lord, unlike the church, which will escape in the rapture. And then he says, but you, brethren, you are not in darkness, that that day, the day of the Lord, would overtake you like a thief. So the day of the Lord will overtake unbelievers like a thief, again confirming that the tribulation is initiated by the coming of the Lord as a thief to take his own in the rapture. The world will experience the rapture as if a thief had come, after a billion or more people are suddenly taken from the earth. On the other hand, the church age believers will not experience the rapture as the coming of a thief, but as an escape from the darkness of the tribulation, being rescued by our bridegroom. So we will not have to face this time of judgment. 
On the other hand, the world will not escape the day of the Lord's judgments, for it will suddenly come upon them and overcome them. This will not be the experience of the church, because it will be raptured. So it is the Lord who initiates the time of worldwide judgment, called the day of the Lord, by coming as a thief to remove the spirit-filled church from the earth. And in so doing, he will remove the restraining force on the Antichrist and evil generally. This results in the birth pains of the tribulation, starting suddenly with great destruction all around the world and intensifying until the return of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2 confirms that in the tribulation, after the church is removed, evil is allowed to come to its fullness through the Antichrist, and God responds by increasingly pouring out his wrath on the world system. Verses 1 and 2 say, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Some were teaching that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, had already come. Again, it's clear that the day of the Lord here cannot refer to the second coming, for they surely knew that the Lord had not yet returned in power and glory. Rather, they became troubled by the teaching that they were in the tribulation, no doubt with one of the emperors being the Antichrist. This would have been all the more troubling if they had been taught by Paul that they were going to be raptured before the tribulation. Paul's response is in verse 3 saying, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, that's the day of the Lord, the tribulation, it will not come unless the falling away or departure comes first. And the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction. Now the word translated falling away could be translated departure. It's not talking about a falling away or departure from the faith, as many think. It does not explain what the departure is, but simply calls it the departure. So we have to look in the context to see what departure Paul is talking about. And it's right there in verse 1, where Paul introduces the subject under discussion, saying, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So he's talking about the rapture, the departure of the church from the earth. In verse 3, Paul is saying that the tribulation will not start until the rapture comes first, and then immediately after that, the Antichrist will be revealed, who is destined for destruction. Verse 4 describes what the Antichrist will do at mid-tribulation, saying he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Then he says in verse 6, You know what restrains him now, so that in his time he'll be revealed. We know what is restraining the Antichrist. It's the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The restrainer is twofold, which is why it's called a what in verse 6 and a he in verse 7. Verse 7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed. This is the departure of the church. When the church is taken out of the way, then evil can come to its fullness, especially in the person of the Antichrist. God allows that in order to judge it. So, the church is restraining the Antichrist until it is taken out of the way, and then the Antichrist will be revealed. That is why he said in verse 3 that the departure of the church must happen first, before the tribulation begins, and the Antichrist is revealed. Then verse 8 describes the judgment of Antichrist at the second coming of Christ, saying, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So, both the Old and New Testaments agree that at the end of the age, just before the second coming, evil will be allowed to come to its fullness, but only for a short time, for God will move in judgment and destroy it, and then he will establish his kingdom on the earth. It's worth pointing out that although the day of the Lord refers to the tribulation as a whole, or any part of it, the actual 24-hour day of Christ's second coming is called the great and terrible day of the Lord, or literally the great and manifest day of the Lord, or the great day of the Lord's manifestation, or the great and notable day of the Lord. 
This is sometimes translated as the great and awesome day of the Lord as well. The book of Revelation gives us the greatest detail concerning the tribulation. It reveals that the tribulation will start on earth when Christ opens the seven seals in heaven. That's in Revelation 6. This proves that the whole of the tribulation is a time of judgment, for it is Christ who initiates the tribulation judgments by opening the seals. Thus all the seven years are the day of the Lord. Moreover, the first seal releases the rider on the white horse, the Antichrist, who goes forth in world conquest. His first move is to gain control of the Middle East by making a seven-year covenant with Israel early in the tribulation, as Daniel 9.27 says, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, that is, for seven years. This is how the Antichrist will initially be revealed and identified. These seven years are the last week or the last seven years of Daniel's 70 weeks, which we will study in detail next time. These seven years, also called Daniel's 70th week, will end when Christ returns to destroy the Antichrist. This is how we know the tribulation will last seven years, as it more or less coincides with Daniel's 70th week.